back to abortion. What are we? Operation Save Abortion? The Abortion Yacht Club? I'm your cruise director, Julie. No, I'm not. I'm Liz Winstead. I am the founder and chief creative officer at Abortion Access Front. And we are throwing this day so that y'all can understand all the ways that you can participate in abortion activism and do it with what, as we learned in our first panel? A reproductive justice lens. You're doing great. I'm very excited. Um, just remember, you had a lot of exercises in that last panel discussion. Oh my God, we put a lot of stuff in so you could pick and choose, but I wonder how you all felt about looking at when you Googled, where's the abortion clinic in my neighborhood? And then compared it to, what's on the I Need an A website. I hope that really set you off as to the disparity in the oppression and the fake clinics versus who's really providing care. I thought that was super eye-opening, so I'm glad you did too. So um, this panel is awesome. This is also the panel that a lot of you really wanted to know more about. Helping patients in this time has become Something that everybody really wants to do. And I think that patient support is something that is, for those new to the movement, it's super skilled, it's super nuanced, and there's so much to consider when helping someone you don't know access the care they need, helping someone you do know access the care they need, the language we use, um, the things that sound good on their face, but when you break it down, which these folks are going to do, will give you a little bit of a, oh, wow, I didn't think of why that might not be great for me to say that or do that to help somebody who doesn't know me. Um, so we're going to break all of that down, and we're going to give you tangible ways that you can help. And I'm very, very excited. So let me just check to see if I have to tell you anything else. If there's anything else about technical things, <laughs> I feel like there's not. I feel like we are good to go. So I'm pulling up anchor. See, I'm going with the boat metaphors because I have a shirt. <laughs> um, that is it with me and boats. I love a pontoon. Feel free to buy me one. I would take that as a donation and give it to all these people so we can go to international waters on a pontoon. Yeah. Can we do that? Yes. Yeah, we'll do it. Absolutely. I feel like that's on. I mean, I'm even going to say yeah. you, want a, you want driving a pontoon boat into international waters. I'm on it. Let's do it. Don't get on that boat. I'm going <laughs> to tell you that. Many things with her. Not on a boat. She doesn't even have the shirt. Anyway, let's get to this panel because it is a good one. All right. You know her from two panels ago. <laughs> She's just from been here. It's very exciting. She is the executive director and founder of We Testify, an abortion storytelling collective that is far richer than just doing that. Um, and she's an incredible moderator and a dear friend. Please welcome Renee Bracia Sherman. Take this panel off. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Hi, everyone at home. Um, we are so glad that you're with us for this panel, which is titled, Put Your Money, Time, and Privilege where your mouth is, how to help patients access care. I am your moderator, Renee Bracy Sherman. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am so honored to, to host, to moderate this panel with some really dear friends of mine. We go way back, but also because I started out doing this work, doing practical support and supporting patients, taking them to their abortion appointments, um, having them stay at my house when they had multi-day procedures. And I did that because when I had my abortion, my boyfriend was kind of a dick and just dropped me off at the clinic. And he said that he couldn't go in there with us or with me because I was killing a piece of us, which yes, that was actually the entire intention of my abortion. <laughs> um, but I felt really alone in the appointments and, you know, of course, the clinic staff and the nurse is really wonderful, but it would have been really wonderful if I had someone sitting there with me. And so I got trained as an abortion doula and started doing practical support. And it's really changed my life and it's work that I still do to this day. But it's also really deep work that we have to actually be trained into. And I know a lot of people are really interested in doing it because What's better in this work than sitting there helping someone get to, from their front door to their abortion appointment, right? That is huge. 
And it's not work that everyone can do because you need to be trained in it, you need to be vetted, all of the things, and you need to understand the cultural competency of supporting people who have abortions. So we're gonna talk about all of that. We're gonna talk about why your auntie network's a little problematic, why <laughs> you don't need to say, we're gonna go camping. You can actually Ooh. just get involved. <laughs> we'll get there. Yes. <laughs> you can just get involved with your local organization. So I'm really excited. I'm, I'm gonna go to the panel and have everyone introduce themselves. So Marielle, I'm gonna start with you. Sure. My name is Marielle Neris Rodriguez and I'm the Director of Client Services for the Bridget Alliance. I use she, her pronouns. And tell us a little bit about what you guys do at Bridget. Sure, the Bridget Alliance is a national practical support organization that I, it offers all-inclusive support for people who are seeking abortion um, later in pregnancy. We support people seeking abortion after 15 weeks of gestation. And we support with anything that's needed to get them from home to their appointments, remain there, and then come back home um, safely after their abortion procedure. So we can support with anything from flights, hotel reservations, meal support, childcare um, support, and essentially anything that is necessary for them uh, to go to their appointment and come back and then get home back to their lives. Amazing, I love it. Um, I volunteer with Bridget a little bit when people are coming to DC, so you love do. it. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Marie. Hi, my name is Marie Khan. I'm with Midwest Access Coalition. So like Bridget Alliance, we're a practical support organization. So helping with that end-to-end -end travel, whether that's driving, bus, train, plane tickets, getting real creative like a young person renting a U-Haul, all of those things, uh, safe hotel bookings, and funding for food and childcare for folks. We work with folks that are traveling to, from, and within the Midwest, so we're more regional. But we treat the Midwest generously um, in, in terms of the states that we encompass, and as we will talk about with closures of clinics, Texans are coming to the Midwest. Folks from Arkansas are coming more up. Folks in Oklahoma have nowhere to go and hop over to Kansas. So the, our worlds intersect so much as more people are having to travel outside of their homes for care. Um, we started fundraising in 2015. I've been with Max since 2016. And I also, um, I'll mention I escort at a pre, now post row clinic up in the Bronx as well. So a lot of us are involved in different aspects of practical support in getting someone to their clinic safely. Amazing. Midwest is best. Yes. Yes. Oh. yes. <laughs> nope. But, yes. <laughs> nope. Like, that said. Just, south is <laughs> uh, just letting you know. Um, my name is Oriaku Njaku. I use she and they pronouns, and I love for folks to mix it up. Um, and I was a co. Oh no, I'll always be a co-founder, right? <laughs> so I was co-founder and former executive director of Access Reproductive Care Southeast, which is a regional abortion fund based in Atlanta, Georgia. However, um, I am the executive director of the National Network of Abortion Funds. Come on, you <laughs> hey. um, And the National Network of Abortion Funds is a national network of abortion funds. <laughs> Um, but also organizations who provide practical support. So rides, lodging, child care. It's really beautiful because the abortion funds who are part of the network not only focus on funding abortions, but they do the work around building power and providing that education for folks who are so enthusiastic and interested in joining the movement, create that safe, sp safe space for people to grow. I love it. And Poonam. Hi, y'all. I'm Poonam Dreyfus Pai. I use she and her pronouns. I am the deputy director of All Options. Um, all Options is a national organization that provides judgment free support for all experiences and decisions related to pregnancy, parenting, abortion, and adoption. Um, we have two national talk lines. One is a peer counseling line that you can call for any reason at any time to talk about any pregnancy experience um, and receive really lovely emotional support. We also have a faith-based clergy counseling line called Faith Aloud if you have um, spiritual conflict where you'd like to talk to a clerical authority um, who, who are you know, abortion activists as well. Um, and then we also do some state-based work in Indiana. So we have um, an all-options pregnancy resource center that houses the Hoosier Diaper Program, where we provide diapers to families all over Indiana and uh, Bloomington in particular, um, and the Hoosier Abortion Fund, which is the only fund in Indiana that provides uh, funding for folks with abortions there. So that's us. Amazing. Shout out to the great pregnancy resource centers that actually <laughs> yeah. support. Right, the one and only pregnancy right. resource yeah. center that supports love everyone. Love yes. it. <laughs> okay, so let's get into it, right? Um, 
that we testify, we end up having a number of people who are sharing their abortion stories. And as they talk about it, they talk about the barriers um, that it takes for them to get from where they are living to their abortion appointment. And that could be anything from the, the restrictions, the laws, but also just planes, trains, automobiles, mm -hmm. child care. Can you each talk about what are some of the common obstacles that you see in your regions and in the work that you do? Marielle, you wanna start? Sure, um, uh, there are plenty of barriers that people face when seeking abortion care. Um, uh, the first one being that um, uh, when uh, you are, or when you make the decision to have an abortion, there isn't a lot of conversation around abortion access. And depending on the laws in your state, your providers um, may not be legally even allowed to talk to you about how to access abortion care. Um, then you go online looking for an abortion clinic, and the first thing that shows up, and the second, and the third, and the 75th thing right. that show up are things that are not actually abortion clinics or organizations that um, are um, going to help you get abortion access and abortion care. Um, and so the, there are a, a lot of different barriers that people face. And then if you are a black person or a person of color, um, then it goes even further back because historically you already have barriers around even being able to access birth control or mm -hmm. get sex education mm -hmm. that allows you to even make um, the decisions on uh, on how and when and if you want to become a parent uh, or get even get pregnant. Um, and so when you take all of that into consideration and then take it further into wanting to get abortion care, um, uh, it's ridiculous. Depending on where you live, you have laws that tell you that you have to um, have waiting periods where you need to wait a long time, several days sometimes to even get abortion access. Um, at, there is no way for you to get to the clinic. Often those clinics are not accessible to you, mm -hmm. especially if you're in a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have to pay for your abortion. Um, if you are someone who has Medicaid, um, you will most likely not be able to pay for your abortion care um, uh, with your Medicaid coverage. Mm -hmm. And so even getting access to the money to pay for the procedure can be a gigantic barrier for people. Um, and so, from from cost of the procedure to getting there and coming back, if you're going to lose work, where do you leave your children? All of those become issues that people have to deal with and are more exacerbated depending on where you are and who you are as a person. Right, and they just kind of layer and layer and layer and layer. Yeah. So, Marie, can you talk about particularly in, in the Midwest where we're seeing a bit of mixed access, right? Yes. All of those barriers and then what is adding with that mixed access looking like? So, I, so I'm originally from Wisconsin, and Wisconsin was a state that when Roe fell on the 25th of June, Wisconsin went dark. There mm -hmm. were folks at the independent clinic in Milwaukee, and once it hit 11 a.m. East Central Time, you, you couldn't have care anymore. So Wisconsin is an example of that. Whereas we have Indiana, a state that's currently legislating to get rid of abortion, but it's not there yet. So you can right. still get abortion in Indiana. So a lot of the Midwest right now, um, Renee, is working with pregnant people who are trying to figure out where they can go based on where they live, what's open, what is either going to get them care finished in one day for them to take their abortion pill, or in the case of Indiana, you'll have multiple visits and waiting times. Mm -hmm. So people are scrambling to determine how to stay as close to home while still being able to access this, this care. And something we often see in the Midwest, which isn't typical, which isn't unique to the Midwest, but um, especially in a region with many rural spaces, is folks that are underbanked and non-banked. So when it comes time to, oh, I need to travel now to Chicago from northern Wisconsin and I don't have a debit or credit card, it's going to be really hard to check into a safe hotel mm -hmm. and, right. and be, be in an area closer to your clinic, downtown Chicago, like right there, able to get care. Folks, are, folks plan to sleep in their car. People have all of, the, all of these plans thought out to how I'm going to be able to get this care safely because I now have to drive a ridiculous, I'd, ar people already had to drive very far distances to come and get care in the Midwest, but now it's, it's more exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And especially in, in this time in the summer where there's shortages on rental cars, not there, with COVID COVID, there's been a reduction in Greyhound and Amtrak trains. There's there's other effects from the, the Supreme Court's rulings so far this year that have now said that ICE and immigration get to check within 100 miles of the border checkpoints. We're already seeing that. 
our my director bought a ticket for someone in Washington State, not in the Midwest, and they had to check off a box saying, I agree that ICE can come on and, and check people's documents. Oh, so all wow. of these things are things that people in the Midwest, in the Great Lakes regions, are, are used to, unfortunately, dealing and having to travel for care. As Marielle mentioned, black folks, indigenous folks, people of color, people in the Midwest who, who haven't had access to, to language resources to be able to then get out, uh, get out into systems of care that they need to access, all of those are big for folks. And I think the ruralness, the travel factor is really hard for folks and the underbanked part is hard mm -hmm. because sending someone a, a, an, Uber, an Uber gift code helps, does not help them at all mm -hmm. when those, those ride shares aren't operating in their city or state and someone hasn't accessed and done that before. That's right. So part of, part of what we try to do at MAC and I know all of our other organizations do is meet the pregnant person where they're at. Not expect a ridiculous amount of learning and knowledge that they're suddenly undertaking but, but showing them and guiding them along the way so they can safely get their procedure while being respected the entire time. Right. Sounds chaotic. Yes. And uh, yes. like our system is fucked. Really, so, really. And I, I think your point about the, the IDs and, and needing a debit card or yep. a credit card, things like that, to so check into a hotel is so yep. important. Because I've done that where I just show up and check somebody into the hotel mm -hmm. just so they can get in, right? Yep. And it feels like those are tangible ways to yep. unfuck the system. They are. So. They both laid out, Oriaku, this, all of this oppression that is kind of, or is, is messing up the entire system. Can you talk about how those interlocking systems kind of impact it? Because it, it sounds like it can't just be done with just individuals. It needs to be both kind of yes. dealing with all the things. Lay that out for us. Yes, yes. So as you were talking, I was like, yeah, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the South, but actually the South and the Midwest have a huge amount of similarities when it comes to accessing abortion care. And so, you know, the same folks that you think of who have ac or have trouble accessing hospitals, have trouble going to see an OBGYN, have trouble getting diabetes medication. This, these are the same people who are having issues accessing their abortions. So when we say abortion is healthcare, we're also really acknowledging the fact that there's so many other layers of oppression and so many other reasons that impact people's decision-making process that they, I mean, the, I wish the government, um, actually I don't wish the government, but <laughs> I, I, you know, like really there's something around the systems being completely changed that is gonna be necessary in order for us to do this work. And one of the things that I keep thinking about is, you know, people are like, let's reform the system. But if we're trying to reform a system that is rooted in white supremacy and the cis hetero patriarchy, mm -hmm. that to me is insufficient. Right. So we have to really think about new ways um, to really think about how we eliminate those barriers to abortion access. And in doing that, it's also eliminating barriers to so many other things that, you know, impact people's ability to access basic health care. That's right. Thank yep. you. So Poonam, I want to come to you and we've talked all about the oppression, right? Like, let's bring it back to what we've been talking about all day. Why do you think that reproductive justice is and, and practical support is this way out of kind of this mess? Oh, there's so many reasons. Um, so I feel like to start with, reproductive justice acknowledges that people are whole people with really complex and nuanced lives and experiences and deserve to be treated and met with dignity and respect from day one, right? Um, and also to be seen within the constellation of their communities and their families, right? They're not just individuals making individual decisions. They're individuals making parenting decisions. Mm -hmm. They're individuals making family decisions. They're individuals making um, loving community decisions. And very few other lenses really take that approach. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing I'll say is reproductive justice also acknowledges that like the systems that we have have more often than not caused us harm, mm -hmm. right? So like when even when we say something like abortion is healthcare, which is true, our healthcare system is broken, right? right? So it's like we want we want abortion to be treated as healthcare, but we want it to be treated better than the healthcare yeah. that we're getting right yes. now. Because yes. it's bad. The healthcare we're getting is bad. Too many people are paying too much money for basic care if they can get it, right? And so, and abortion is not dissimilar from that, unfortunately. Um, so I feel like reproductive justice also acknowledges that, right? That the existing supports are nowhere near enough. And in order for us to have the lives that we want and be able to raise the kids that we want or have the families that we want um, and to be able to do that in a thriving way, our whole systems need to be demolished. And yep. <laughs> yep. Something new must come from it. Yes. And I have full faith, I have full faith in 
um, in the leaders of this movement and their ability to imagine a better world mm -hmm. um, and, and help us see it through. Sounds like a lot of work. It is. Um, <laughs> but I, I know that we can imagine that world. And, yeah. and part of doing this work with practical support is imagining that other world, which you will be doing at home <laughs> during the session after this. So get ready. Um, there are lots of different ways. Some of you have named the different ways that people can show up with practical support, whether it's lodging or giving rides, things like that. And we can talk a little bit more about what that looks like um, in a minute. But um, there are not always things that individuals can provide for strangers or you know people who are seeking abortions, right? And so we still um, need people to be able to donate. Mm -hmm. yes. um, because people do deserve the privacy of having a hotel room for yeah, their right. abortion um, yep. or being able to say, actually, I would like to take a cab and not mm -hmm. take a ride because I don't feel comfortable being in a car with a stranger, mm -hmm. right? And so we do need donations and money to do that. Um, and so I, I want to be clear to everyone um, out there who's listening, it's really wonderful that you want to get involved um, and... Well, you can't just like show up at an abortion clinic and offer your <laughs> your yeah. car uh, to people. It's kind of like when you get to an airport and they're like, "Don't take a ride from a stranger." <laughs> yes, those rules still apply. <laughs> okay, because you might be a really nice person, but so is the I guess the grandma doing the sidewalk counseling mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. So we really want to make sure that people who are traveling for their abortions know who they can trust and they who that they can um, people that people are vetted and are going to care for them, right? Um, and then we also would just discourage you from going camping and Where <laughs> offering just your oh, couch. I don't right. <laughs> right. Say abortion. Just say, say, <laughs> say abortion. Hello, abortion. my mantra. Right. Just say abortion. But also. Um, just to offer, I mean, I get that you want to offer a, your couch for someone to stay at, and that's really, really wonderful. And it's really great when they're able to have their own space, have a room in your home, their own space. Um, or also that they know that you've been vetted and that you're like a legit person. Yeah. Because the reality is, is that when they're trying to get their abortion, they're they're actually scared and dealing with a lot, right? The whole force of the government has told them that they don't deserve this health care mm -hmm. and that they should be criminalized for it. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily know who they can trust, whether it's people in their families um, or, you know, anyone at the clinics, things like that. So they're, they're trusting you, and it's really important that you go through the processes that um, organizations in our communities that our movement has set up. So... Please do that. We love you so much and want you to volunteer. And I promise you, the trainings are a lot of fun. Yes. And you get to meet really nice new people. So just mm -hmm. go through the training. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we talked about this in a, in a previous session with the clinics and, um, and now for funds and patients. What are some ideas that you have been seeing that um, are not as helpful as people think they might be. Mm. Oriaku, I'm coming to you first. I see that look. <sighs> what are things that are, people are really trying, yeah. right? Yeah. But it's just, it's not as helpful as it could be. Right. No, there are so many things that come through. Folks are like, oh, they could sleep on my floor. <laughs> So if you had a family member that was coming to visit you, would you want them to sleep on the floor or would you try to prepare some space for them to sleep? Um, there are folks who are like, I can give you a ride. But as Renee mentioned, like getting a ride from some random person, not necessarily the best. And even having the cultural competency to understand like what this person is going through. For instance, you know, being a white person driving through wherever, even in the South and Midwest, that's fine. There's a less chance that you're going to be arrested. But me taking someone across state lines, me driving through a sundown town, mm -hmm. that's, those are obstacles that come into play. Um, Real I quick, did, can you oh. say what a sundown town yes. is for uh, folks who might not know? Yeah, so um, this was back well, actually, there's still some sundown yeah. towns, yeah. but... Um, racism's still alive. It, racism <laughs> is a thing. Um, where as when the sun goes down, um, black folks are expected to be in their homes. Otherwise, it's fair game. You can get assaulted, you can get beat up. It, it really yeah. doesn't matter, but as, as soon as the sun goes down, it's time to go inside. Um, there have been ridiculous, whew, ridiculous ideas like, let's put an abortion clinic on in an Indian reservation, and I'm like, 
have y'all talked to indigenous people? Like there's already no. issues getting health care as an indigenous person. And the idea that you would put an abortion clinic in, on a reservation and have people who are not involved, who don't you know, understand the culture, just come in and get an abortion there. I mean, I'm like, can you please think out these things beforehand? Can you mm -hmm. please think out your strategies um, before you get really creative? And I'm all down for getting mm -hmm. creative, but there's there's some level of like, okay, let's let's bring it down and bring it re well, be real about it and figure out what actually makes sense um, for the people who are needing to access care. Um, yeah, there's so many there's so many things, but those that are the fresh too. ones coming yeah. in. Well, I just say too that aspect about indigenous communities as right. well. You know, when you're talking about now taking over oh, the land on. and the space of people and communities that have already been Hello. marginalized. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Literally from the founding of this country, Hello. Come on. and then come to them with conversations about setting up clinics or putting vans in front of casinos mm -hmm. um, oh as a way to then provide the women, many of them just mostly privileged white women, in yeah. your communities with abortion care in their states because now they can't access it. It's racist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's rooted in racism. Right. Yeah. Um, many of those communities don't even have the basic, like, things um, in there. The, many communities in indigenous uh, land lack electricity right. and yep, just exactly. basic access to utilities. Right. Water. And Water. now you want to talk yes. about yourself and say, can I bring my clinic right. to your land? So it's not about you, it's about me bringing me mm -hmm. to your mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. It's very problematic, it is. and people really need to watch how they're treating this in indigenous communities and in other communities as well. Right. I mean, hello, can we not recolonize land we already colonized? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then second, why did you not think about the the abortion access that indigenous people right. needed right. Right. until you lost your own? Yes. Okay. Because one of the things, um, I'm writing a book on abortion, and so I've been doing a lot of history reading, and one of the things is that the United States government actually took land um, from indigenous communities based on the fact that they would not stop providing abortions in their communities. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a really difficult history in the way, it's not difficult, it's not even the right word, really racist yes. colonialist yeah. history um, of our government denying indigenous people access. And so to then say, well, I lost it over here, so now I'm just gonna go do a land grab again, mm -hmm. right. is mm -hmm. really, really painful and I, I think I, I'm sure people think they're being well-intentioned, but they don't understand the history and how harmful that is to nope. indigenous folks. Yeah, so right. shout out to um, Indigenous Women Rising yes. 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 organization. So shout out to them, check them out, um, and donate to them because yes. guess yes. what? Indigenous people need abortions too. <laughs> yes. so, um, Okay, so let's get back to the like the abortion explaining. What are some of the <laughs> other things that, that you've heard, Marie? Um, especially in the middle, we talked about the camping euphemism and that trope. It, something that we often see in the Midwest, I think there's the, there's the mindset of like, I'm gonna cook food, I'm gonna make a meal, all of these things. But like, again, we, we, this, should not, this should not be something that is patchwork, that is piecemeal. That's right. So the people with the power, the folks who, who have the power, who haven't been stepping up, like, yeah. like put your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. Like you wanna give a, you wanna like, you know, provide lodging to someone what connections do you have to actually get hotel vouchers? Like, yeah. what, can, what can you do to work with, like you said, Renee, and everyone's mentioned the existing organizations on the ground. Right. Um, something that I, I personally have seen in the Midwest, which bothers me a lot, is the, and I know this is a slightly different topic, we have fake clinics all over the place, mm -hmm. crisis pregnancy centers. And in the Midwest also, there are many, and the same as the South, um, hospital structures that are run by religious mm -hmm. entities. Right. The Catholics mm -hmm. will run hospitals. Yep. You don't know it is. Well, you might if it says St. Luke's. You can take a, you can take a gander at it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't actually know until you need to go to the ER to get plan B. Right. Or you need to go to the ER because you're pregnant and you're bleeding and you right. don't know what to do. Right, you're having a miscarriage. You're having right. a miscarriage. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, where does the whole, like, come camp with me help with that? Yeah. Right. Like, it's, it shows to me that people, A, don't understand, aren't talking to people who need abortions. So yeah. they're not understanding okay. those individual experiences for someone. People do not usually have the luxury of time to mm -hmm. plan and figure out their mm -hmm. abortion. When they're reaching out to folks like us, they've already scrambled to find the the... Five twenty-five to seven hundred dollars they need for their medication pill, or yeah. more money to get their 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 um, their surgery covered, their sedation. If they're farther along in pregnancy, like the folks Marielle assists, if you're you're thirty weeks, thirty-two weeks, and you need to travel outside of your state to go to D.C. for care, for life-saving care, yeah. 
That is not something that, hey, I'm going to hop on Google and Reddit and look for look for the nearest auntie who's dropped Ooh. her info. You know, <laughs> and I'm sorry, aunties, aunties, aunties are white. I'm sorry. Aunties, like, I'm Yo. sorry. Mm -hmm. I've never read a white, white people like don't need to have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, your aunts. No, no, <laughs> that's not appropriate. And it's disgusting that we are telling people, hey, you, you've come to us, you've come to us in need, you've reached out for all of this, you've come to politicians and legislators and everyone, and this is like the last stop, you need to have this care now. And yeah, our, our, our solution, America's solution, is to put you on the couch, on the floor, with, you know, mm. a bed, you're no. I mean, that's, you're going through that labor. tracks though, right? In terms of it's how so we brand. treat people, yeah. it, yes. feels, yep. it feels accurate. We still shackle, what is it, 34 states don't have legislation that prevents the shackling of pregnant people. Right. Not right. Pe people giving birth, people having an abortion, what have you, pregnant people. Or incarcerated. So yeah. all of these things need to be addressed and looked at and talked about, as opposed to these, these vague references to abortion. Also, the last thing I'm gonna say, if you're offering your space up, you should say abortion. Yes. Someone should come to you and say, hey, I need to go camping. And then you have that conversation. Sure. Don't use use your privilege. Use the fact that you have access to this. Say the word abortion and actually show up and be there for people. That's right. Yeah, I think we need to keep in mind, too, that um, uh, having good intentions can be very, very harmful. Yep. Um, good intentions doesn't mean good outcomes. Yeah. And you really need to keep that in mind when you're trying to support people who are seeking abortion care. Um, the people that we support, you know, after, just like Marie mentioned, you know, when you're helping someone who's at 30 weeks of gestation go get an abortion, this is not just taking a little pill yep. um, and then going home and putting a little pad on your tummy. This is someone who is going to go through labor. This is a multi-day appointment where someone is going to be uncomfortable very often, where someone is going going to want to have their space and their privacy mm -hmm. and their ability to like go through whatever process they're going through physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, financially, yep. mm -hmm. um, in order to get through that process. And having someone there that they don't know, that they don't trust, that they have no idea where they came from, can be really harmful. Yep. And so you really need to keep that in mind. There are organizations locally, um, regionally and nationally who can provide support to people and are there to give the help. And so if you want to be helpful, go to your local organization, go to the APRA website yep. and find your local organization and start from there. Get trained, get the language, get the, the, the baseline that you need in yes. order to actually be helpful and not fall into the harmful aspect of wanting to be helpful. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you just started there, right? Like here's what people need to do yes. to get involved. And there's so many things that people can do, right? Yes. And I think, I just wanna, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. You said something and I would like to double click that mouse. You said we should listen to people who are having yep. and have had abortions yeah. about what they need. Oh, no. huh. Do oh, you no. hear that? <laughs> Listen to people who have and are having abortions about what it is that they need. Because if you haven't been through an abortion, let me tell you, there are some secret things that you just don't know. <laughs> you can go to wetestify.org slash abortion to learn some of them. <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to talk about what are some of the things that, that people can do to make themselves open to people in their lives who need abortions, right? Because activism starts at home first. Yes, that's right. It starts in our families, in our communities, right? right. And so, um, of course, like people can stock up on pregnancy tests. Sure. Yes, the ones at the dollar store. Yes. Just as good yes. as the really expensive yes. ones, yes. I promise. Yes. Um, people can stock up on Plan B because those are $50 a pop real expensive, get a bunch of them. And, and also then people don't have to like try to get them out of those stupid little boxes, the plastic boxes in the store. They're very annoying. Um, what are some other things that you all think people could do to prepare and support someone who's having an abortion? I mean, I, I think about um, just having some cash on hand ready in case someone needs it. Um, you could uh, have all of the things that you need for recovering for an abortion right. at home, those, the real thick pads. Yep. Um, do not offer people really like hearty soup and stuff after their abortion. No. It's a lot. Keep, keep the food light, off, ask them what they need. Like just being ready, right? No. What are for each of you some things, maybe like one or two things that you all think would be great? Poonam, you I wanna start? start? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I was gonna say to begin with, um, when we talk about being someone who 
says the word abortion, what you're doing is making very clear that this is not a thing you're gonna stigmatize, mm -hmm. right? This is not a thing you're gonna shame someone for. It softens the ground for someone who is going through something for which they are extremely vulnerable, right? Like even if they're making a decision that they feel really great about, the forces that are surrounding us, the water that we're in, the air that we're breathing is telling them that they should be ashamed, they should regret this, they should be feeling grief. And if you feel all of those things, that is okay, but you deserve support regardless, right? And so when you are someone who can say abortion, when you are someone who can ask like, how are you feeling? What do you need? Leaving those like open-ended questions for them to be able to name like, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I need. Mm -hmm. You are signaling to someone that you care and that is a really powerful thing that you can do. Um, we are a country that likes to talk. I said this when we were prepping. Also, we're a country that likes to talk. We're not a country that likes to listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what people who are having abortions need always, but especially in this moment, is to be listened to and heard and respected. So I feel like that's a, that's a baseline thing you can do without materials, without money. You can just be a person that listens with a lot of compassion. Do you hear that, Joe Biden? Does it cost any money? No money at all. Does not cost no. Congress? It's just a thing. You could just say the word abortion and listen to people who have abortions. Oriaku, what are some other things people could do? Oh my goodness. I feel like one of the really important things is doing the work, like that political education work to understand why we're ev even in the place that we're in. Yep. Really doing that work to understand the difference between reproductive health, mm -hmm. reproductive rights, and reproductive justice. I would say the first two focus on the me, but then reproductive fo justice focuses on the we part of it. So really thinking of like, if we're trying to fight for our collective liberation, what does that mean? How mm -hmm. far are you willing to go? Um, liberation doesn't mean, oh, well, we're going to be liberated from all these things except abortion or except racism, you know? Um, the other thing that I would say is really thinking about the people that you're supporting as people. Mm -hmm. They're not patients. They're yes. not your client. They're not just a caller. They're actual people who you live with and work with and love in your communities. Um, and so that is one thing that, you know, this is not a transaction. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity that can be incredibly transformational for a lot of folks. And if you don't do the work to be very intentional and even ask, how can I support you today? Absolutely. You know, then it really is just you coming in with some white savior complex yes. or some other complex trying to do the work versus being a co-conspirator and really showing up for people in the ways that they need. I love that. Like treat people as your equal? Yeah. Yes. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is not a charity case. This right, is not like, right. a, oh, let me, no, it's like they're people. What a concept. Hmm. All right, Marie, what do you got? When, when I'm sometimes talking with folks who are trying to figure out where to get started, I'll say, you know, well, what's, what is the community that you're tied to, that you're invested in? Well, folks that reach out to us that are like, I have high schoolers now, I'm worried about my, my children's reproductive future. Okay talk to, we have high school social workers in Chicago that reach out to us that say, yeah. we need pregnancy tests. And these are, you know, spaces like Chicago where we think abortion, sanctuary, city, haven, all of this. There, there are people slipping through the cracks, yeah. our people constantly. And young people, young people is a huge, huge yes. component of that. Mm -hmm. So for instance, just as an example, for, for me and for our work at MAC, we, we put together emergency contraception kits. So that's one area that, hey, you can put together these kits, like, like Renee mentioned, buy EC, put together those kits, Put them in your local, your local free, free fridge in your free community. library, your free library. Community yeah. library. If there's not that, get it started, yeah. and recognize, like Oriaku mentioned, the the intersectional approach that people need within reproductive justice and reproductive health care. So the same folks that that are looking for EC also may have a need for diapers. Yep. May have a need yes, for formula. The formula do. crisis. So so maybe maybe you don't have a car. Maybe you don't feel feel like you're capable, uh, and, and that's totally fine of being able to activate in other ways. But you can you can get. EC kits together. You can be you can be someone that your 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 children's peers trust and come to right. in a high school context. You can be someone that your family members know they can ask information of, and you're going to give that reproductive justice non-white savior ex explanation and history and context because you want it, it to be about the we and not about the you. Yeah. So so figuring out those those communities, especially young people, it, they're a community we all care deeply about. Um, folks that English is not their primary language. Mm -hmm. um, that is another community where trying to make sure that those folks know where they can go to access safe, trusted care and get the materials and supplies they need. Mm -hmm. So I recommend if you're overwhelmed, start small. Think, what can I do? What are the communities I know about and the communities I'm intersecting with that I can respectfully support and meet? Mm -hmm. And look to what they need. I love it. I love it. 
Riley, round us out. Um, uh, I, I think I, what I would say is that people need to remember that words matter and that before you speak, you really should think about what it is that you're saying because your words carry weight mm -hmm. and what you say to the people around you and the people um, uh, who are listening to you will have an impact. How big that impact is can depend on the person, but it can have an impact overall. I've seen a lot of people, especially on social media, talking about, oh no, people who get abortions at 30 weeks wanted a pregnancy. They were expecting a baby. They wanted a baby. And so this is a hard decision. Um, yes. Many of the people that we serve had planned to be parents and wanted the pregnancy and are going through a very, very difficult emotional decision. And then there are people who just had no clue they were pregnant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then yep. there are people who went through very, very horrible trauma and then were in denial or didn't understand or just didn't have the concept that this could happen to them right. and didn't realize they were pregnant until 40, uh, until 28 weeks of yeah. gestation. Right. Yeah. Um, and so there are people who come um, to make a decision about abortion care from so many different perspectives and so many different walks of life. And so the words that you use to say, oh no, this is a difficult decision or this is horrible or they wanted to be parents, that matters and it carries the perpetuation of stigma and the perpetuation mm -hmm. of right. stereotypes mm -hmm. and, and, and of other people thinking that if you are having an abortion, um, especially later in pregnancy, that either it's because something dire happened to your health or yeah. because there was a fetal anomaly or because you're bad. Yep. <laughs> um, so please, please check your words, check what you're saying, um, and check your bias. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay, so we've talked about all the things that are not helpful. <laughs> Let, let's tell the folks at home what is helpful. Um, what are the things that you wish people who are new to the movement, who are listening out there today that are like, okay, great. I hear it, I'm gonna do the work, mm -hmm. I'm gonna examine my language, right? I'm gonna talk to folks in my community and I do wanna get involved. What is something, um, maybe one thing from each of you, what is something that you wish they understood about the abortion fund or practical support organization that you are involved with? Marie, you wanna start? I wish that people understood better the lack of resources, and this, this tag team's on um, all options and what they do, the lack of safe spaces for people to go to to get literally all option pregnancy care. It is so hard to do that in the Midwest. And oftentimes folks, not just the Midwest, but especially the Midwest, folks get that information when they finally schedule their appointment and get to go to their abortion provider. So I wish people would understand and see the incredibly toxic trail of, we're not gonna allow you to have sexual education. Right. We're not going to let you know and understand your body as young people. We're not going to let you, if, if, if you even think you're queer, we're going to report you to the government now, mm -hmm. depending on the state you're in. All of that means that someone is not going to understand their body. They're not going to be prepared for when, when they consensually have sex, when, when horrific things occur to them. So we're already failing people at that point, and they don't have that, that educational structure in place. And we need to start there. We need to start doing that to get people in a space where they, they have all the resources there for them. They understand their body, and they can have greater autonomy over their own choices. And I think in the Midwest, we, people don't appreciate. They think, all right, you know, Chicago, people, Chicago's a safe space, this and that. Chicago has so many fake clinics. Indiana has so many fake clinics. Right. Mac, we've gotten people who have gone to a crisis pregnancy center, been told, oh, you're, you're nine weeks, you're eight weeks pregnant. And then they come in, and they're in their teens. They can't mm -hmm. take the pill anymore. They can't do any of this. And these, these are those entities in our backyard that are getting Midwest tax dollars. Yes. Right. Illinois has done some good work, but Wisconsin, like it's, it's disgusting. So I really, I would encourage people on the ground level, examine where your city funding is going. Ima examine what city ordinances look like. Mm -hmm. Who is there? Like maybe your abortion clinic left, right. but, but what, who's gotten to maintain and continue that stigmatizing language and those practices? Mm -hmm. You know, folks that, that aren't there providing the diapers and the formula to people when they should be. So that would be something I would really encourage people who have the, the energy and the time and the connections to really, really drill down on that because it is a disgusting endemic situation all over the country. And we especially see that for our rural communities. I love it. Yeah, it's like, here's the problem and let's flip it on its yeah. head of how we can yeah. solve it. Great. Right. Um, Mary Ellie, let's go you and then we'll come all the way down. <laughs> sure. um, uh, you know, we really focus um, at Bridget Alliance on ensuring that whatever it is that we do, we do it thinking about 
what the person that we're serving is telling us is best for them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so whatever you do, however you get involved, whoever you get involved with, um, uh, do it because it is what's best for the people that you're serving and not because it's what's best for you. Mm -hmm. This is not about you. This is not about how you would treat your pregnancies. This is not about how you would decide for your body. This is about how other people decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you're coming into this work with that mindset, then you'll be fine. And do it with organizations that yes. are already um, settled. Yes. And we, everyone on this floor here works together. Yeah. We see one another every day on Zoom. We <laughs> co coordinate and collaborate with one another. I know the organizations in New York where people can, you know, go and if you want to stay in someone's house, you can, and they're trained to do that. Yeah. So there is a little bit of everything everywhere and there's a space for you and what you can do. And if you can't do anything physically, then just go to your closet, take whatever little clothes you have and take it to the local store and sell it for $2 and donate those $2. Yeah. $2 will help, help us get someone a bus ticket. Mm -hmm. So anything that you can do will help. Awesome. All right, so in our last like minute, yep. uh, Poonam, what are you thinking that you want folks to go out there and do? So two things. One is, um, again, the clients, the patients, the people have the answers for themselves. Your job is to hold space for them if they're talking to you about their experience and bear witness to their experience. It's not to have an agenda for what they're going to do, right? And that's hard for us, especially when people in our lives are making decisions that maybe we wouldn't make or that we have feelings about. But our feelings are not important in those moments or, or need to be set aside so that we can show up for the people in our lives. Um, if they're having abortions or if they're considering abortion. So that's one. The other thing I would say is, you know, we're talking about doing this work with organizations and please have patience. Like these organizations are small, we're grassroots. We are not massive entities. We are coordinating our work together, but like, you know, All Options has 10 staff people, right? We've been doing the work for 17 plus years and a lot of that time was like volunteer run. So we're small, we're scrappy. We know we are experts, but we don't have the capacity to meet everybody's urgency, right? We're not moving at the pace of urgency. We've known that Roe was going to fall for a long time. We have been building this work for a long time. So we need you in the work for the long haul, too. I love it. Oriaka, close this out. Abortion yeah. funds. What are we doing to support them? Oh, my goodness. So to support abortion funds, fund abortion. Yes. 110%. Yes. Um, you know, the abortion funds that are in your communities may not have the same uh, brand recognition as some of the larger organizations. Yes but they're there and they're doing the work and showing up for folks in community every single day. So if just because you haven't heard of an organization doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is what brings you joy? Like yes. what makes you happy? What are you really passionate about? And see how that can be used in supporting people as well. Supporting some of these organizations who are scrappy, but we shouldn't have to be. We should. no, like yeah. that shouldn't be a thing, you know? Um, whether you're making donations for general operating expenses or the direct service, those are things that the organizations need. And so if you're a graphic designer, help an abortion fund out. Yeah. If you have some clerical skills, admin work, you know, is something that folks can use. There's a wide range of things. And so really think about, again, what brings you joy? What are you really good at? And how can that be in service of the people who are doing the work? I love it. I love it. Thank you all so much for this fantastic panel. I see that we're getting close to the dock, and so we've got to bring our cruise ship director back up. Ooh, that's my that's my boat voice. Take it away, I am Liz. back. Thank you. And I just want to button on Ori because remember in our exercises last session where I said tap into your shit, know what you're good at, know what you can sustain. Mm -hmm. yep. Buttoning that. Thank you so much because I think the the what. The, the savioring complex can be hard, and you all made the most brilliant points about why sometimes these ideas aren't awesome. I just wanted to add one, and that is offering yourself up means that one other person gets to know about somebody else's abortion who doesn't really, who, who that shouldn't be. No. The least yeah. amount of people that can be involved in somebody's procedure is where we want to be. And to honor that always, to say, if I really care about the bodily autonomy of somebody, that means I care who they get to bring with them if they want to bring somebody. Mm -hmm. I don't make that decision. I can, I can throw some resources your way to do that. 
You know, I want to make sure they feel like they can have the feelings they want to have in a hotel room. I want to make sure when I'm taking this on that that person doesn't have to indulge me oh, because yep. they're in my home. Oh. Yep. Right. And 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 I don't want someone to feel accountable to me mm -hmm. because I helped. Yeah. Right. Yep. I simply want to help. Yes. And if you simply want to help, these organizations are going to fill you in on ways. And the other thing about abortion access front is we work with these folks all the time. And so we've been with Ari Macon post-abortion care kits for people, right? So as we come up with creative ways that these folks know patients need pre-care yep. and post-care, that might look like, hey, what are people saying to you about something they might like on the way to the procedure? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to create those kits and then get them to us so we can distribute when they have capacity, those are some really good things that we're gonna be able to help you do. And, and just really understand this long term. It's really a marathon. And, and these people are doing great work. You have their social media handles always. Their websites are here. Like we put it up a million times. And we're going to connect you. So get vetted. Get vetted so you can be connected. So when time comes and they say, let's get you on, you've been vetted because we're not the feds. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that. We're vetting you for good. So. Some stuff is going to happen. Thank you, Renee and panel. I don't even thank know if I said so thank you, so pardon me. I didn't even <laughs> think I said thank you. Um, but some stuff is happening right now. Remember, the comments are there. People are answering. That is awesome. Now, you're going to go into your breakout session after this panel, and then that breakout session is going to take you into lunch. So here's some things we want you to really focus on. We want you to focus on brainstorming everything everybody said and how you can apply those things to patient care. We also... Um, we also want you to do some review evaluation and talk to some people who are throwing out their, you know, their big ideas about why it's a good idea to dress up like a handmaid and carry a hanger and drive somebody to their abortion. All those things are terrible. We know. So, you know, correcting the record is really helpful and then giving them those emotional reasons why. So, have some great conversations. You're going to write some postcards. Uh, you're going to chill. You're going to eat. You're going to pee. You're going to do your stuff. Um, have some conversations and make some donations. You're gonna do all that, right? So, then you're gonna to go to lunch. During lunch, you're gonna, you know, maybe continue some conversations you didn't get to have in the last couple of things. Um, regroup, take a breath. You're doing really great work, you're here, and I'm very proud of you. So, also, Marie, I'm just gonna put a plug in. This one, dropping all the knowledge, Marie and I and Moji, who's hosting the next panel, have a podcast. We're, I think almost all of you have been on it. If you have not, we, 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 uh, um, the deeper conversations with each one of them in their work, we do our podcast, Feminist Buzzkills Live. Go subscribe. Also, just like when you're wondering what to do, the calls to actions, it's a really good place to go because nobody else is doing the weekly updates and the downloads. You watch the news, and they're having a reporter who reported on what Ori's doing or what Marie's yeah. doing. It's like, why are you having the reporter? We got the real people. Cut the middleman. Have the conversation. Those are the things that are important because that is the inspiring piece. So that is happening. Um, what else do I got to tell you? Oh, you know, all the things. We're back at three. Did I miss anything, Max? No, you're good. Okay, I'm losing you at this point. What's happening? I don't know anymore. Um, it's great. Get your shit done. Go have fun. Back at three. Calm breaths. <laughs> Yay. Yay! This message is brought to you by Abortion Access Front. Exposing sexist shitheads has never been more rewarding. Donate to the Abortion Access Front. AAF, making abortion accessible again.